Just a quick announcement before we start. Hopefully, you saw my slide post. Uh, we'll, we'll try to take photos after the second uh, morning lecture. So at 12 30, we'll promptly walk over to the fair and field. And uh, uh, hopefully, I'll get a few minutes more. So we have time to go and drop the. Say again? Why do, why do you do it 10 minutes later? So we have time to go to the, the rooms to take the two sets and then come back. You don't need to wear a t-shirt. I think it's okay. Yeah. No, no, it will be too no. bad. <laughs> I think it's okay. Then you'll all look the same. Yeah, they're all the same. We can't pick you out. <laughs> uh, you know, there'll be some with t-shirts. Those are the measured few bits. <laughs> um, one thing that always tricky, like, uh, you know, some people follow directions. They go directly to the field. Then others kind of linger around and get just you know, engrossed in this physics discussion. And then there's a group, you know, majority group sitting in, in the sun at Fair and Field waiting for two or three people to circulate. So please, you know, let's go directly there as soon as the lecture. And the question. You're talking about the field that's like just as a Yeah, the one we walk by when we go. There's a, when we go to the, uh, to the lunchroom, we go by entrance to the field. It has yeah. a sign over Fair and Field. That's like, we'll do that. In the backdrop of a uh, flat Perfect. Okay, good. Thank you, Christine. Okay, thanks. Is the microphone working? Okay. Uh, so this is uh, lecture one, uh, part B. Uh, so just to remind you, we have uh, some kind of three dimensional cavity. We have a um, superconducting qubit or synthetic atom sitting in there talking to the electric field, which is polarized parallel to the axis, uh, where, which carries the dipole moment of this qubit as the Cooper pairs slosh back and forth. And uh, the dipole coupling is uh, 10, 20, 30 million times bigger than for ordinary atoms. Uh, and um, in the approximation, that this is sufficiently anharmonic that we can treat it as a two-level system. Uh, the, the Robbie Hamiltonian looks like this. The electric field uh, flips the spin, the pseudospin. It excites from ground to excited or de-excites from E to G. And the coupling is uh, very, very strong compared to any uh, dissipation. It's on the order of 100 megahertz. Okay, so uh, so we have, um, if we focus on a single mode in the resonator, it's a harmonic oscillator. If we focus on the transmon qubit, it's uh, approximately a two-level system with frequency omega q, and then there's this coupling, and then there's uh, a little bit of damping which we'll try to ignore as much as we can. Uh, if you make the rotating wave approximation, uh, so you throw away terms that both add a photon to the cavity and excite the qubit at the same time, uh, you're, you're left with this James Cummings Hamiltonian. And then if these two <clears throat> are detuned from each other, uh, by an amount that's bigger than G, 
but still small enough that the rotating wave approximation is good, <laughs> uh, you can end up with this dispersive coupling. Uh, and uh, so let me uh, explain that dispersive coupling in what's called, uh, what the atomic physicists call the dressed atom picture, okay? So first think about just these two terms, uh, sorry, these two terms in the Hamiltonian uncoupled, okay? So uh, you can have the Hilbert space is the span of the qubit states, e.g. tensored with the span of the oscillator states, the Fox states 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay? So let's, let's draw a sketch. This is when the qubit is in its ground state and the number of photons is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So there's a, a tower of harmonic oscillator states, all with spacing H bar omega resonator. If I leave the qubit, uh, sorry, leave the oscillator in the vacuum state, n equals zero, but I excite the qubit to E, that costs me energy H bar omega Q, right? Because, uh, Sigma Z flips from uh, minus one to plus one. In computer science notation, there would be a minus sign here. And uh, it's uh, terrible. So many sign conventions. Um, uh, and then if you're in the excited state E, they're uncoupled. So again, the harmonic oscillator states make a tower with the same spacing H bar omega, okay? But there's a the, this excitation, as I drew it, is more costly than adding a photon. The qubit frequency is larger than the resonator frequency. We call that the detuning. Could be positive, zero, or negative. I'm assuming that its magnitude is bigger than the, the coupling we're now going to investigate. So I can do a simple second order perturbation theory, okay? Everybody okay with all that? All right, so, uh, so what, what does this dipole coupling term do? Well, it could, uh, um, if you were in the excited state of the qubit, it could lower, de-excite the qubit and excite the cavity, okay? Where does that go? That takes you from here, ah, takes you from qubit excited, cavity empty to qubit de-excited, cavity containing a photon. And then the other term, takes you in the other direction, right? Uh, there's another term the, the, in the Robbie Hamiltonian, there's this other term which you neglect in the rotating wave approximation, but that does something like take you from qubit in the ground state, cavity in the ground state, to qubit excited and the cavity excited. Well, that's a huge uh, energy change. And in perturbation theory, maybe we can ignore that. That's the rotating wave approximation. Is that clear? So if these are close together, uh, we'll just focus on that matrix element that couples those guys. Okay. So what is the matrix element? Um, uh, well, it's G, and then uh, square root of n. Uh, uh, well, which n? Uh, well, it's the one, I'm going to use the one on the left. Okay. So you, you get a, you get a, uh, a square root of n or a square root of n plus one uh, from 
uh, the matrix element of the uh, creation operators. And um, we have to decide which N we're talking about. So let's say, uh, if we talk about the one on the left and I destroy the, the photon and jump up there, I get square root of one. If I'm up here, I get square root of two, square root of three, and so forth. So I'm gonna use the N on the left when I write the square root. Okay, well now, so now I have some level N and uh, N minus one like that. And they're coupled and they're gonna, um, they're gonna repel each other, right? Second order perturbation theory levels repel. And uh, the size of the repulsion, G squared uh, uh, is G squared over uh, delta, right? Matrix element squared over energy denominator. And uh, one of them, uh, one of them goes down, and the other one goes up. Well, I can make that happen by just having a sigma z there. And then, <laughs> what sign you put here depends on whether you're a computer scientist or a physicist. But uh, the sign's not too important. So, I, at this hour of the morning, I won't attempt to get it correct. Okay. So that is. Uh, 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 oh, but wait, the important thing is there's a square root of n, it's g square root of n squared. So I should write g root n squared, and this is equal to chi uh, n hat, you know, if I want it to be an operator, and chi is g squared over delta, okay? So if I think of this as a, an operator, I, what I wrote down here was the matrix element for a particular N. Then I get this, the dispersive coupling. Okay. So how to think about that? Uh, well, first, what, how do I interpret it? Well, first, what's the frequency of the cavity? It's the coefficient of A dagger A, right? Ah, oh, but now there's another A dagger A. So the frequency of the cavity is the bare frequency plus chi sigma Z. The frequency of the cavity now depends on the state of the qubit. Okay, it goes up or down by chi, depending on whether the qubit's in the ground or excited state. Well, that's a little strange. So uh, suppose I have a, you know, an optical cavity and I put a piece of glass in there, right? It changes the optical path length because of the index of refraction and it uh, uh, lowers the frequency, okay? But it the glass doesn't absorb the photon. Why? Because it has some kind of band gap uh, and, uh, if you are smart, you chose a glass that has a bigger band gap than the frequency of the cavity. What's that? That's uh, detuning. The glass is unable to absorb the photon because it has the wrong frequency. Okay? The glass doesn't have a single uh, uh, energy level, but all, all the energy levels are bigger than this. Okay? Same thing in the state mode. Real dielectric constant. Yes, exactly. You have a real dielectric constant. Uh, well, now, uh, <laughs> uh, well, what does it mean when the qubit is in the excited state and the frequency changes sign in the other direction? It's like the glass reversed its uh, in dielectric constant or index of refraction. Got smaller than one instead of bigger than one. Why is that? Well, because uh, if, a, if a photon comes in to the atom, 
and tries to excite it, but doesn't have enough energy, you get a certain sign of the energy denominator in the intermediate state, and you get a positive contribution to the dielectric constant. But if you were already in the excited state, uh, uh, and it's a two level system, so we forget about the fact that the photon could send you up there, then it tries to stimulate emission from the atom, but it has the wrong frequency and it comes back. And now the sign of the energy denominator is reversed and the glass looks like it has the reverse contribution to the index of refraction. Okay. If you want a sort of DC analog, imagine I have a magnetic field coupled to a spin and the magnetic field's uh, pointing that way and the, and the spin points that way to be in the ground state. And now I add a little magnetic field in the up direction. How does the spin respond? It responds by moving towards. But how does the excited state respond? It goes in the other direction. So this, you know, it's like under screening and over screening kind of thing. Is that clear? Okay, so now this is fantastic because uh, this commutes with the, the operator sigma z that tells you what state the qubit is in. This commutes with the photon number in the cavity. So it's doubly q and d. It doesn't change either of those things. But if the frequency of the cavity depends on the state of the qubit, I'll just measure the frequency of the cavity and boom, I have a qubit readout. If the spectrum of the qubit, the frequency it takes to excite the qubit, which is the coefficient of sigma z, well, uh, that depends now on the number of photons in the cavity. It has a light shift. So now I can measure the state of the cavity by seeing what the, how much energy it takes to flip the qubit. So this is, together with drives you apply to the qubit and drives you apply to the cavity, gives you universal control of the combined system. Where, yeah. So one, one of the common, this is like lamb shift, the second thing is like a lamb shift. Like uh, so there's a one half here that I left off. Yeah. That's the lamb shift. That's the, that's the, okay, right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And, and uh, the other point is, so when you, can you put this in a quantum information context? Like when you learn that say, for example, you you know you look you now can measure a shift in resonance of the cavity. You've learned about state of the qubit. Is that collapsing the wave function? What, what uh, I'll I'll show you. Uh, good question. I will show you uh, exactly how measurements work and where the collapse happens. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. Um, okay, so now uh, uh, we're gonna, th this chi, which is G squared over delta, G is gigantic. E it's so gigantic that even if delta, uh, the two objects are detuned by 20% in frequency. I mean, huge detuning, gigahertz. This is so big that even the second order effects of the coupling, the dispersive coupling are 3,000 times bigger than the rates of dissipation, the decay of the cavity and decay rate of the qubit. It's gigantic, okay? And so you can do all kinds of, you can make it gigantic, you can also make it smaller. Uh, this gives us uh, extremely powerful and easy and high precision control, which I'll try to explain. So here, here you see, the spectrum of the cavity. Where is the resonance frequency of the cavity? Well, if the qubit uh, is, if uh, um, typically chi is negative, so um, won't go into why, but uh, if the qubit is in the excited state, the cavity is here, the resonance has a width associated with the damping of the cavity. 
the line width of the cavity. And that in turn is uh, typically due to the fact that you open the door to the cavity to probe it. It's not internal losses. The Q of the cavity is, uh, you know, 100 million to a billion. But if the qubits in the ground state is way, way, many, many, many line widths over here, okay? So if I bounce microwaves off the cavity to figure out what the cavity, where the cavity resonates, I, I learn the state of the qubit, okay? Okay, so this is, uh, this can be extremely, large measured in, uh, uh, you know, it can be a few megahertz, which turns out to be, you know, a thousand line widths. Okay, so, uh, so uh, I, the, the, there's some details. Uh, I derived the S matrix for reflection from a cavity. You remember when you drive a harmonic oscillator and you hit resonance, the response is 90 degrees out of phase with the drive and it's in phase at low frequency and pi out of phase at high frequency. That's the state of the, the oscillator itself. But if, if you're bouncing microwaves off a cavity, you're not measuring what's inside the cavity, you're measuring what's reflected. And the phase shift is twice as big, it turns out. Uh, but that's all derived uh, in here, which is in the reading material section of the webpage. But uh, basically the idea is I have uh, uh, a wire a transmission line. I send in microwaves at some frequency. They go through a magic gadget called a circulator, which uh, uh, contains uh, uh, ferrites, which are uh, magnetized. So you don't have time reversal symmetry. And the circulator has the property that when you go in this port, you go out the next port. And when you go in this port, you go out the next port to the, in the clockwise direction. So what happens is the microwaves come in, they go and they go into the cavity. They detect the, you know, they excite the cavity and then they come out. They don't excite the qubit because it's at a different frequency. They come out and then instead of going back the way they came in, they go out over here they go to a, a special quantum limited amplifier. It's a whole, I could give a whole school just on that, how that works. Comes out, goes to like a regular hemped uh, amplifier like in the front end of your cell phone, then up to room temperature, more amplifiers, and you can detect the phase of the microwaves after, relative to the incoming phase and see whether it changed. So. I'm gonna go now to the not strong dispersive, but just like say uh, the splitting is, you know, order of the width. And if you, as you go at the, the, the reflection phase doesn't change from zero to pi, it changes by a total of two pi, it turns out in reflection, uh, pi in transmission. And uh, so as you go through the resonance, the phase changes by two pi. Well, where is the resonance? Well, it depends on the state of the qubit. So when the qubit is in, uh, I don't know, let's say the ground state, it's this curve. When it's the excited state, it's that curve. So I sit right here at the bare resonance frequency omega r, and I will see two different phase shifts, plus theta and minus theta, uh, coming out depending on the state of the qubit. Is that clear? Yeah. So, you know, here you're measuring the phase, but is is that more technologically technically uh, convenient than just like measuring the actual resonance, like you know, the the real part? Um. So so okay. So it's unitary every photon you send in comes out. So measuring the, the if you have a, a phaser, if you measure the length, there's no information in there, about, but if the phaser is like this or like that, and you measure this component, which gives you the phase, then you learned something. But, but what if the, 
isn't there a measurement you can make that uh, that's on the top plot? This is like the this is the uh, number of photons inside the cavity when you apply the drive at different frequencies. The qubit is going to know about this, but we don't know about it on the outside. We don't want to. So when I the cavity response means uh, how many? Uh, what's the amplitude of the wave inside the cavity when I drive it? It's not something we have access to on the outside. Saying that, like if I if I were to just do a transmission through a cavity, I wouldn't see that the transmission that's high at when I'm. I don't make uh, yes, you would. Right, right. That's true. But that's just a more difficult experiment. Uh, uh, so um, it's actually an easier experiment, uh, but not as good. So Michel Devere says transmission is for amateurs, reflection is for professionals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so uh, there's information. In transmission, you could open another port here, and if it has equal coupling, then at, a, at resonance, 100% goes through. Uh, uh, off resonance, which each of these will be slightly, there's some reflection. And then you don't get all the information about the state of the qubit, you only get half. And there's some information here and some there. It's much better to do reflection, but you have to put in these circulators and you got to watch out if some of this leaks over there and you know it's, it's why it's for professionals yeah okay uh all right so if you if you think of this phaser picture like this is the the cosine omega t and and this is the sine omega t uh amplitudes right the phase change is just shifting uh you know you get this or that depending on the state of the qubit okay so now here comes the collapse part the answer to your question, okay? Suppose that the qubit is in a superposition of G and E. It's at, at pointing in the X direction on the block sphere. Okay, well, what's the frequency of the cavity? Well, it's, it's entangled with the state of the qubit, okay? So initially I have a product state. This is uh, what you call a coherent state. It's just some amplitude and phase of the initial microwaves coming in. It's unentangled with the state of the qubit. It's in a product state, okay? But then the microwaves come in, they pick up a phase shift that depends on the state of the qubit and come out. So now you have an entangled state where if the qubit is in one state, the microwaves come out with one phase. And if it's in the other, qubit's in the other state, the microwaves come out with a different phase. But where's the photon number in that wave function? Uh, uh, this, There's a, that's a microwave. But this is a state of definite phase, so indefinite photon number. So, but that alpha is the probe one, or is it also the photons in the cavity? Uh, no, this is the after. This is the S matrix. You start out with a coherent state and a transmission line. It bounces off and it comes back. It's still a coherent state outside the cavity, but has a different phase. But it, I never talk about what's inside the cavity. Never talk about, right. So you talk about the state of the qubit cavity, but not state of the photons in the cavity. No, no, no. This is the state of the transmission line. I'm, I'm going to launch a wave towards the cavity. It has definite phase and indefinite photon number. Stuff is going to happen, and it's going to all come out. And I'm going to ask, what is the amplitude, you know, the amplitude, the phase in the transmission line afterwards, going to my towards my detector? To calculate that phase, I have to figure out what happened while it was inside the cavity. But okay, but the qubit's inside the cavity, and you're including that in the wave function. Sure. So there's alpha times the state of the qubit. In principle, there's also a catch of n photons in the cavity. Well, the photon starts out in 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 vacuum. The cavity starts out in vacuum. Oh, vacuum. Then this wave heads towards it. It gets some photons for a while. They evolve in phase depending on the state of the qubit. Then they come back out. There's another effect. They sometimes don't go inside the cavity. They just bounce off the entrance. 
and you get some interference between the ones that went inside and the ones that didn't. That's why the phase shift is twice as big. Does that help? Okay, so this, so, so, you know, when you learn about measurements, you know, you, you're taught about old bore and, you know, there's some effective measurement and everything collapses. Well, it's not that way. Real measurements, you never measure the qubit itself, right? It's this tiny thing. You don't measure it. You entangle the state of the qubit with some macroscopic meter. In this case, a wave with lots and lots of photons in it that you then measure. And when you measure this phase, you, uh, you say, oh, I'm in this, then the qubit must be that. Or, oh, it, the measurement came out here, I'm, the qubit must have been that. That's how all real measurements work. And there's also, there's also you have seen the shift up and the qubit is up plus the other world, you know, many worlds. <laughs> Not, you know, uh, so I personally feel that the many worlds interpretation is not very parsimonious of universes, so I, I don't like it. But now, okay, so you call the phase shift classical variable, that's where you stop it. Uh, well, uh, okay, uh, we, <laughs> I'm not going to go there, Leo. <laughs> uh, but I, I'll talk about it a little bit in the sense that. It takes time to acquire the phase information because um, uh, there's a little, you know, there's shot noise in the measurement. You, you, you know, you have to be uncertain to get the, to know the phase well, you have to be uncertain how many photons there were. It takes time. You have to send a coherent state um, uh, with some uncertainty in the photon number, has n photons on average and fluctuations of square root of n, but it's a long wave packet that uh, has a very well-defined frequency, so it's very long, and it takes time to acquire all that signal. And, and th there's a kind of fuzziness because uh, the, the in-phase quadrature, like cosine omega t, that's like the position of an oscillator, and this quadratures like the momentum of that oscillator. They don't commute. You can't measure both quadratures of a microwave signal perfectly because they don't commute. So there's some you know, fuzziness. And that fuzziness, when you try to distinguish these two guys, these blobs are overlapping until after a long time, these arrows have gotten very long because you've got lots of photons. It just takes time, okay? So when you measure this quadrature with a homodyne measurement, uh, you get um, a probability distribution of the signal. And if the qubit's in the excited state, you draw the signal from this distribution. If it's in the ground state, you draw it from this distribution. And they overlap. So there's a chance of an error. And But when uh, uh, the splitting between these grows linearly in time and the width only grows in square root of time. So if you wait long enough, you can fully resolve them. Of course, if your qubit has finite lifetime, it may fall down in the middle of that and mess you up. But this method can be used with uh, uh, between two and three nines of fidelity to determine the state of the qubit. Yeah. More the power you send in in reflection, which is larger alpha, or hot alpha. Right, or fixed power for a longer time. It's a, yeah. Because th that's the thing is like, if I increase, if I increase the power of my wave packet, it could be a production that could be spread out more. Yeah, if you keep the same amplitude, you need to have more time. But in any case, it has to be spread out in time so that the frequency uncertainty is much less than the width of the cavity, so you can get uh, um, resolved. So you have good enough phase definition to see the small phase change. Yeah, does that help? Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> you, you could decide 
you haven't actually done the measurement yet, right? It's bounced off, it's headed towards your detector. And at the last minute, Matthew comes in and says, wait, 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 don't measure the phase, measure the number. Okay. So quickly you switch before the packet hits, right? And then you learn nothing about the state of the qubit. You only learn how many photons were in that packet that you sent. And that tells you how far your qubit, which was in the X direction, has precessed under this Hamiltonian, okay? So just like in a Bell state, what, you, what Alice gets depends on what Bob measures, right? And this is an entangled state between the meter and the qubit. And what you, the back action of the measurement and the information you learn depends on what you measure. So in the, if I measure phase, then I don't, I don't have a back action on the, on the qubit, on the signal V. You, well, you, you, no, no, you, okay, now we're, <laughs> if you measure uh, the phase in a quantum trajectory picture, uh, you know, the, the sigma z starts wandering up towards one of the poles, but the uh, x and y become uncertain. When you measure z, you have to destroy information about x and y of the qubit. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, so here. You've you've collapsed. You've collapsed either this or that. So now, whenever you have an entangled thing and you fully measure the state of one of the objects. The entanglement can no longer be there because it's in a definite state. Okay, so I want to make sure I understand what happens when you measure n. Ah, so if I measure n, so this state has uncertain n, that, that has uncertain n. But if you now have definite n, then during the time that that packet was, was in the cavity, the bigger n causes the qubit to, when there are fluctuations in n, the qubit uh, x and y components precess. And that's, uh, that is the effect. When you measure the phase, you don't know what n was. And so now your x and y information becomes, uh, uh, d starts to disappear or get. Yeah, so as you measure z, your x and y information about the qubit starts to go away. So you can figure out the whole, yeah, measurement back action and you get the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, working because when you measure Z, you can no longer know X, et cetera. It all works out. So that's a transmission line. It's a, uh, uh, it's a uh, one-dimensional relativistic boson, bosonic mode. So you can make a packet that has linear dispersion. You make a wave packet, it just goes down without changing shape, bounces off the cavity, comes back, still has the same shape, but uh, is uh, phase shifted. Does that help? Uh, uh, in optics, it's a hole or a partially reflecting mirror. In uh, electrical engineering, it's uh, the the wire yeah sticks into the cavity a little bit and is capacitively coupled to the internal mode. Okay, so uh, so here you see uh, quantum jumps. The qubit spontaneously jumping back and forth. This is the measurement, you know, of the state. Uh, here's the uh, proposal, just uh, uh, the first paper. Uh, here's the first experiment measuring uh, the qubit with the dispersive coupling, and the first um, 
you know, single shot measurement where you could see these jumps in real time was uh, from um, uh, the Siddiqui group at Berkeley. This particular data is from uh, the Devere group at Yale, okay? So you see quantum jumps, something is thermal or intentionally driving the qubit and it's not, it's not smoothly evolving from one ground to excited, it's jumping, which is what happens when you monitor it and measure, okay? Okay, so we used the, free, the fact that the cavity frequency depends on the state of the qubit to measure the qubit. Now let's use the fact that the uh, frequency of the, the same term in the Hamiltonian, just rearrange the parentheses, <laughs> the frequency of the qubit depends on how many photons are in the cavity, okay? So um, you say, before we said, oh, what's the frequency of the cavity? It's the coefficient of A dagger A, so it's omega R plus chi sigma Z. Now we say, Oh, what's the frequency of the qubit? It's the, co one, uh, the coefficient of one half sigma z. That's the old qubit frequency plus a shift of two chi every time you add a single photon to the cavity. So if I measure the spectrum of the qubit, how much energy does it take to flip the qubit? I find out how many photons are in the cavity. So same term in the Hamiltonian, you can work it frontwards and backwards so to speak. Is that clear? Okay, so how does that experiment work? So there's some, uh, here's uh, uh, what we'll call the storage cavity, very, very high Q, and it has the photons in it that we want to measure, okay? And it's dispersively coupled to our transmon qubit, which has its nose sticking in under the tent there. And uh, we're going to send in a tone and try to excite the transmon and flip it from ground to excited. And the frequency of the tone it takes to do that tells me, you know, the transition energy of the qubit, which tells me how much it's been light shifted by the photons in there. But how do I find out? Normally, when you do spectroscopy, right, you have a box of gas. You shine a laser through it and you see how much gets absorbed, right? Well, this is different. This is called quantum jump spectroscopy. I'm not gonna see if this photon was absorbed. I'm going to see if the qubit changed state by coupling it to a low Q readout resonator, also dispersively. And I'm gonna do the experiment I just told you. I send down a wave and I see the frequency shift of the readout resonator that tells me what the state of the qubit is. Is that clear? Okay. And so uh, that's called quantum jump spectroscopy. I don't see if the laser light or the microwave light was absorbed. I see whether the atom changed its state, which is the same thing. Okay. This is very high Q because I want to store the, some photon state in there and not have it change. Uh, this is low Q so that I can read out quickly. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to store in here. I'm going to do, I'm showing you now ensemble data, uh, uh, putting a coherent state in here, which is a superposition of many different Fox states. So the photon number is uncertain, and I'm gonna make these measurements thousands of times, and this is the result, okay? This is the spectrum of the qubit. Here's the frequency of the tone I applied to the qubit, and then this is the result, did it flip or not, okay? And here you can see the frequency of the qubit when there are zero photons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight photons in the cavity. Okay, they're not separated by 3000 line widths because the graduate students were in a hurry and, and power broadened them by a factor of 100 for those of you and know what power broadening is. So what do we learn from this curve? 
Microwaves are not waves, they're particles. Okay. The energy in the microwave field comes in lumps, quanta. It has a, they have 100,000 times less energy than the light that triggers the uh, rhodopsin isomerization in your eye, so you can see, but they're still particles. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the dispersive coupling. Uh, well, it's, um, you know, it's a few megahertz. Yes. How is what? Oh, well, there's a, there's another, we use the same, uh, line or another line to put some sort of photon state in there. In this case, a coherent state, which just all you do is put a little classical drive on it and get it, uh, oscillating. Uh, don't have to, no. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, this is the uh, uh, Poisson distribution in a coherent state, which I'll derive in the next, in the th third lecture, yeah. Here's some uh, other data showing where the graduate students were a little more patient and, and you see uh, narrower lines. Uh, and uh, this gives you a way, I wanna emphasize this is a quantum non-demolition measurement of how many photons are in the cavity. A photomultiplier just eats up the photon and triggers some current. Here, I just measured the qubit but it didn't eat up the photons in the cavity. So I could measure it a second time to make sure I got it right. I can, uh, and if there's measurement errors, I can repeat and do majority voting. Yes. Yes. If I measure that this is the qubit frequency, the cavity collapses to N equals one. I, so, so quantum non-demolition doesn't mean that when you measure the state, it doesn't change. It collapses to something, whatever the measurement result is. But if you, quantum non-demolition means if you make the measurement again, you'll get the same result. That's what it means, it's repeatability. But of course, maybe I made a mistake in the measurement, uh, it's not, uh, you know, just some technical errors. I got the wrong answer. But suppose I measure five times and do majority voting on the result. I can beat down the so-called dark counts and raise the so-called quantum efficiency to near perfect. So, uh, so we proposed uh, using that for axion dark matter detection, uh, and there's already been one uh, experiment. Uh, axions are some putative dark matter, so solve the dark matter problem and the strong CP problem. And they, in the presence of a magnetic field, they convert into microwave photons. Yep. You said in response to the last question that it did project, right? So there's a, you, you know, now you put an indefinite N in the box state. Yep. But, but that's still quantum non demolition because. Can you because, that again with the quantum demolition? Yeah, so suppose um, suppose the cavity contained a superposition of uh, three and five photons, and I put a photomultiplier there. Well, photomultipliers don't actually resolve the number, but imagine I had a res resolving detector. I would either get three or five, but afterwards the photon number would be zero because I ate them up. So then if I measure again, I will get zero. Whereas here, if I'm in three and five, it collapses to either three or five, but it's still there. And I, if I measure it again, I will get five, 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 five. That's the difference. That help? Like one is, I mean, they're both non-unitary. Well, collapse is, collapse is not unitary. So how do you describe the... The, the, the collapse operator commutes with the thing you're trying to measure. That's, or the, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the reason this uh, uh, detecting number is hugely advantageous instead of measuring the amplitude, 
is this uncertainty principle. You can't measure both quadratures of the amplitude. And uh, there's vacuum fluctuations, which are of order one, and the axion signal is of order 10 to the minus five. But if you count photons, it's either no click or one click. You don't get amplified vacuum noise. And so you gain orders and orders of magnitude in principle in speed in searching for these uh, axions. Okay. Um, it turns out you can measure the photon number parity without measuring the photon number. So the, what, the state collapse is different. And you can do it. Uh, with very high fidelity and very high non demolitionness. Um, and the way you do it is with this same dispersive coupling. If you put n photons in the cavity, the frequency of the qubit changes and it begins to process at a rate proportional to how many photons there are. And so you can arrange things. So if you put the qubit in the x direction on the block sphere, if the photon number is even and you wait the right length of time, it'll precess by an integer multiple of two pi. And if it's odd, it'll, it'll, uh, 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 okay, it'll, it'll precess by an even number times pi or an odd number times pi. So the qubit will end up in plus if the photon number parity is even and minus x if it's in the, if it's odd. Yeah, you have to know chi, sure. You have to calibrate the experiment. Uh, so, and then here you see, uh, okay, I won't try to explain this, but this is a series, 400 consecutive parity measurements, and uh, the jumps in the parity uh, are extremely rare because uh, the it's not getting damaged by the measurement itself. And because the cavity is very high Q and photons are not leaking out and changing the parity. I'll, I'll, it's kind of complicated to explain yeah, this. The change in parity. These, these they are jump, they change, it changes every once in a while, but it, it, that's the photon left. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. All right, so we're now, uh, woo, uh, finished with lecture one. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. The measurement time. Sure. If, if, uh, if the cavity doesn't have high enough Q, the photon number may change while you're measuring it. If the, qubit doesn't have a long enough lifetime, then the spectroscopy, you know, you put it in the excited state, you start to measure it, it falls down, then the phase shift, you know, the measurement, you're integrating it changes, you can get the answer wrong. So, um, well, it's pretty fast. I mean, you, you, you don't get uh, two nines of fidelity unless it's roughly 100 times shorter, the readout time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, if there are, um, if it's truly Q and D, there will never be a jump. If somehow in the process of coupling the qubit to the cavity, if the transmon, uh, you know, accidentally absorbs one of the photons, even though they're detuned, you know, or there are things that could go wrong, but uh, you can repeat this measurement 500 times roughly before you damage the parity. Because the dispersive shift comes from Yes, that's that. Okay, uh, we have an expert here. Yes, and so the qubit has a actually much shorter lifetime than the uh, cavity, and when they're slightly hybridized, the lifetime of the cavity does go down. That's, we call that the inverse Purcell effect. 
And sadly, that's a yeah fact of life. Uh, but it's not serious here because the Q and Dness is 99.8 percent. But excellent question. Yeah, it's true. When I said there's the dispersive coupling and look, it commutes with sigma Z and A dagger A. Uh, that's those are dressed operators in this. Uh, uh, you know, the cavity and the qubit are coupled and there's slight hybridization. And if there's dissipation, that hybridization uh, uh, can become a problem. Okay. All right. Okay, now. We're gonna, so I've showed you how to drive cavities, you know, how to drive qubits, how to uh, uh, me make measurements, okay? Now we're gonna try to use that toolbox to do, to, to imagine building a quantum simulator. Uh, and um, we particularly like uh, bosons because our microwaves are bosons. And everybody knows that fermions are hard to simulate on a qubit quantum computer because you got to build in all those minus signs. The qubit operators commute, they don't anti commute. Almost nobody knows that bosons are even harder to simulate than fermions in some cases. Um, and uh, uh, there's uh, so we can imagine building quantum simulators for condensed matter models that involve bosons and spins, okay? And uh, we're also interested in, uh, you know, the high energy physics version of this with lattice gauge models. So uh, we'll see where we get. So, so, you know, there are all kinds of, ways to do quantum simulators. You can have something which is kind of an analog simulator. It's just you build a quantum system, it has some Hamiltonian, and you say, that's the Hamiltonian I'm going to simulate, right? It's not programmable. It's like saying, uh, you know, I'm going to simulate iron by a simulate, uh, you know, having a piece of iron. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not that bad, but it's, it's not really programmable. Programmable means I have maybe universal control and I can, you know, by trotter, trotterization and applying sequences of gates, I can make an effective time evolution as if the Hamiltonian were something that I had chosen and programmed. Okay. And uh, uh, between Trotter Suzuki and, and BCH, uh, which, in, you know, if you don't have a term in your Hamiltonian that you need, but the commutator of two terms in your Hamiltonian is the thing you need, you can build them up. Okay. But in any case, you need to be able to make good gates and accurate and non trivial uh, uh, measurements. And hopefully, you know, like you'll, we'll hear from Emmanuel Bloch uh, starting tomorrow all these amazing measurements you can make in, in atomic physics with cold atoms, you can basically measure wave functions, right? Measure amplitudes. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of, that's a reason you would build a simulator like this because you can reach in and measure things that you can't measure in iron by sticking two electrodes on it or something. Okay. Uh, now there's sort of an excuse that, oh, we can't build a, a uh, universal quantum computer yet because it's too noisy, but maybe we could use our crappy thing for a simulator because uh, maybe it's less, you know, it's robust, more robust against errors. I'm not sure that's really true. And actually probably for good simulation of interesting non-trivial physics, probably we're going to need error correction. Yeah. If the Hamiltonian is encoded in the analog on the simulator way, but the measurement Programmable, would you call it personal or like read group array uh, given by like, Van der Waals before the measure? Well, uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, 
Um, that's interesting. I mean, uh, I think in both cases, the idea is you can measure things that you can't normally measure in the real thing. Uh, but the Rydberg array, it has some particular Hamiltonian. But by doing lots of gates and stuff, you can modify the effective dynamics to get a different Hamiltonian sometimes. Yeah. So it has intrinsic flow and Yes. Yes. On the other hand, you know, getting rid of those by applying gates yeah. may be hard. So, you know, every platform has its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. And every experiment you see today, all the parameters were fine tuned to kind of get the particular limited result that is nice, but uh, uh, to, to simulate a different Hamiltonian, you'd have to change all the parameters. It's not, you know, we're not really in the era of fully programmable yet. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, uh, uh, maybe 2D models. So here's a, a, an array of cavities. You see the harmonic oscillator states inside each cavity. I'm going to uh, put in a controllable beam splitter. So in optics, a beam splitter is, you know, it's not really a half silvered mirror, but it's morally equivalent to that. Uh, these beam splitters can be turned on and off uh, in, and they can have a controlled phase. And I'll talk about how we do that. And so that allows photons to hop on the lattice from one cavity to another. It's a little weird because every cavity is gonna have a, intentionally have a different frequency. So these are active beam splitters that not only move the hop the photon from here to here, but change its frequency so it fits in the next cavity. Uh, that helps us turn it on and off. Then we might also have some transmon uh, qubits one or more coupled to each cavity dispersively. And we can apply drives to the cavities and drives to the qubits and turn the beam splitters on and off. So in the spirit of, you know, uh, non-equilibrium quantum dynamics uh, of this conference of this school, we have, um, uh, you could do quenches, you can, you know, they're going to be sort of uh, flow K simulations like you do in optical lattices, you can do similar things here. Okay. Uh, so um, we have, you know, it turns out if you wanted to simulate bosons with qubits, it would be very inefficient. I won't go through why that is, but we have native bosons. We have direct access to these operators, A and A dagger which automatically have the right matrix elements, square root of n and square root of n plus one. In a qubit simulator, you have to have a whole quantum arithmetic section to compute or to realize that square root of n. That's why it's hard. Um, okay, and we, so we wanna to try to figure out like instruction set architectures that we can um, use to program our, our simulator. And we've, we've actually written an extension of, uh, of Qiskit, uh, the Qiskit language to handle, which was written for qubits. Uh, we've tricked it into handling uh, bosonic modes as well. Okay, so uh, we might fantasize uh, that, uh, that we could uh, do, for example, strongly interacting two-dimensional bosons moving in a magnetic field and realize the fractional quantum Hall effect uh, for, uh, for bosons. The bosons here are microwave photons. You know, they're not charged. How am I gonna get them to think they're charged particles in a magnetic field? And I'll show you that. Um, and if you could do that, you could see that they obey fractional statistics and have fractional charge. The excitations have half a photon in them. Uh, so how many people here, you're mostly theorists, how many people here know about the fractional quantum Hall effect? So you would wreck, good, I'm because I'm not going to go through the details. I want to get to how we might simulate this. Yes, and you need to convince the photons that they're interacting. Uh, so lots of people have been thinking about this particular 
problem. Uh, I won't, uh, you know, you can find these on the, on the web page in the slide deck. And uh, so, um, so I want to do two target applications, uh, a kind of Bose Hubbard model in two dimensions in a magnetic field uh, with you know, repulsive interactions that'll, that could, if we could succeed, would give us the fractional quantum Hall effect. And then uh, uh, Z2 lattice gauge theory in one dimension. So this is tricking photons into thinking they're in a static magnetic field, charged particles. This is tricking photons into thinking they're in a dynamical gauge field. Okay. All right, so I'm not gonna go through, uh, you know, the Laughlin wave function. Uh, just remark that, you know, everybody, when the fractional quantum Hall effect was discovered, it was obviously just amazingly important and a complete bolt from the blue. We had no idea what was going on. Everybody was trying to solve it. And Bob Laughlin developed an entirely original technique for solving this highly correlated problem. He wrote down the wave function in one line and won the Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing. Okay. So the, the wave function, Z is a complex number that tells you why, where you are in the XY plane. I'm imagining now not a lattice, but the continuum. And uh, the wave function vanishes rapidly whenever two particles come together. So it has really good uh, correlations built into it. And uh, furthermore, uh, uh, there's this plasma analogy, again, won't go through the details, but it turns out that if you add uh, a single extra zero of the wave function somewhere and you calculate the charge distribution around it, you'll find out uh, that uh, a fraction, only a fraction of a charge is there. And so the, the objects, the, the defects, the quasi holes and defects in this state carry fractional charge and fractional statistics, okay? So uh, if you know about it, fine. If you don't know about it, just think it's amazing and interesting, but we won't, don't need the details. Okay, all right, so how do we, I'm gonna do a lattice version of this. How do we, how do, we do this with microwave photons, which after all are neutral? Uh, okay, so, uh, we're gonna do the Bose-Hubbard model. We're gonna have a term where the bosons can hop from one mode to another mode. That's gonna be our beam splitters. We're gonna need, it turns out disorder is an important part of the uh, physics of the transport in the fractional quantum Hall effect. We're gonna need random site energies. And we're gonna need, uh, the bosons to repel each other. So this is, you know, N, N minus one Bose-Hubbard interaction. And also we're gonna need the static gauge field. These, these hopping matrix elements are gonna to need to be complex in a way that we can control. Okay, so that's, how do we do that? And everything I'm gonna show you has all been done in the individual, you know, in one or two cavities, but not yet in a giant array of cavities. But it's not, you know, it's possible to imagine that it could be done uh, in your lifetime, if not mine. Okay, so this, this, Ham, this Hamiltonian, this model has a very rich phase diagram, depending on, you know, the parameters you choose. You could have a superfluid, a Mott insulator, uh, Anderson localization of free particles or a Bose glass or the fractional quantum Hall effect. So it's a nice model with lots of parameters that give you lots of phases of matter. Um, okay. Um, all right. So how do we get the bosons to hop? That's the first step. Okay. So the way we get them to hop is with this beam splitter interaction. And uh, here you see a, a programmable uh, thing with four, four sites in the lattice, one plaquette. There's uh, cavities 
there is a transmon with a Y shape that's coupled to two different uh, cavities. We call this a Y mon. <laughs> And by driving the transmon at, and pumping it, it turns out you can induce uh, the photons to hop from here to here between two cavities that have different frequencies. And you make up that frequency difference through the energy supplied by the driving the pump. So it's in optics, this is called four wave mixing. The transmon is an anharmonic object. Remember, it's got that cosine phi potential. If you expand the cosine, phi squared is a harmonic oscillator potential. Phi to the fourth is an anharmonic thing. And by supply, so in Feynman diagram language, you know, uh, four photons are interacting. So you can send in two classical modes, pumps, and you can choose their frequency um, difference to be the frequency difference between the two cavities you're trying to get the photon to hop from. So uh, pump photon can come in, photon from cavity A can come in, different frequency pump photon goes out and the photon jumps into the other cavity and the frequency change is supplied by the difference of the pump frequencies, okay? This is this is the this is the transmon uh, phi to the fourth term. Yeah, yeah, it's coupled to both cavity A and cavity B and to the two pumps. There are four photons there: A dagger, A dagger. Yeah, two pump photons and a cavity A photon and a cavity B photon. Uh, well, it it uh, be, the the phi to the fourth to, no, it's kind of virtual. The, think of it as now a weekly instead of a two level system. Yeah, In, instead of a two level system, think of it as a a weekly anharmonic self interacting Bose mode with a phi to the fourth term, and that phi to the fourth the phi gets uh, hybridized with the pumps and the cavities and produces this net effect where. Uh, photon from cavity A jumps into cavity B, and the energy difference is made up by these classical pumps. You can that produces this Hamiltonian. You can also change the frequencies of these pumps and produce two-mode squeezing, where you create photons in A and B simultaneously, making a entangled state between the cavities. But this is the one we want, the beam splitter. Okay. So the cavities have different frequencies, but by turning on the pumps, I, I make it as if they were degenerate. I turn on hopping from one to the other. Okay. Uh, so here is, um, uh, we put zero photon in one cavity, one photon in the other, and we swap them. So this is a picture, uh, which I'll explain in a later lecture of the kind of uh, probability quasi-probability density in uh, phase space, position, and momentum. This is the vacuum, and it's not a point. You're looking directly at vacuum fluctuations there. Uh, this is what the one photon state looks like. And so if you look, well, the, this is the cavity that started in vacuum. Uh, after a swap, uh, uh, you're in the one photon state. After uh, an even number of swaps, like 60 swaps, you're still getting very good, uh, very high fidelity swapping, okay? Uh, infidelity per gate of 0.08% uh, per swap. Um, okay, now, um, so that this, this beam splitter operation is now, uh, all, all that we need. We can turn it on or turn it off or change its phase. So we can, we can um, uh, if we phase lock the pumps that are used on all four beam splitters around a plaquette, we can make the photon hop around the loop and pick up a phase as if it were a charged particle in a magnetic field. This is 
very similar to the Floquet engineering that you do in uh, it's a cold atoms, except that we get individual control of every single link, uh, whereas they have more global control. Okay. And so, uh, so you can, it acts just like a particle in a magnetic field. Uh, I, okay, I, there's a whole technical discussion about what does it mean to phase lock two uh, things that are at different frequencies. Maybe I'll uh, skip over that, uh, but, but it's described in the slides and I'm happy to discuss it if people are interested in the technical details. But the, it's, um, it's the same thing you have to do in atomic physics. Okay, uh, you can get random site disorder by uh, making these pump frequencies be slightly off so that when the photon jumps from one site to another, it doesn't get quite the right amount of energy. Well, that's equivalent to just changing the local energy of the, of the site. So we can build in uh, programmable random site energies if I want. Um, and, uh, yeah, the fact that these are detuned is sort of like having a time dependent, uh, vector potential, which is a, you know, equivalent to a, a gradient of the electrostatic potential. Okay. Uh, now the most important thing, how do I get the bosons to think that they are particles that repel each other? How do I get this to happen? Okay. Well, we're going to go back to our friend, the dispersive coupling. Okay. And we're going to notice something interesting. Suppose, remember that the frequency, we're going to have that ancilla transmon coupled to each cavity. If I send in a pi pulse that's going to flip the qubit from ground to excited, and I choose this frequency, it will flip the qubit if and only if there's exactly one photon in the cavity. Because if there are two photons, this is off resonance. It's too far away. Okay. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to, um, okay, the bottom line is I'm going to be able to attach a phase to each Fox state in the cavity. How do I do that? Well, let's say, let's take M equals three. I do a pi pulse on the qubit if and only if M equals three, there are three photons. Then I do another pi pulse shifted in phase. I rotate around a slightly different axis and bring it back. So the qubit starts in the ground state, ends in the ground state, but acquires a berry phase, enclosed area, that depends on what I chose there. And that berry phase only got applied if there were exactly three photons in the cavity. That's because you're picking out the yes right so then i just apply a whole bunch of these pulses all at the same time one for each possible value of the qubit resin the qubit frequency and i can apply any phase that i choose to eat to each fox state okay is that clear so i can i can uh i can execute this so-called Gates, a uh, number selective phase gate. So you pick that to be proportional. Uh, yeah, so I pick that phase to be, uh, hmm, seems to be missing, uh, 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 proportional to M squared. And then that's the Hubbard interaction uh, time evolution. If I, if I take the Hubbard interaction, which is N squared roughly, and evolve it for a little bit of time, I get e to the minus n squared. Say, you know, e to the minus. I program it. I, I all, I, every, every qubit starts with a rotation, let's say, by pi around the x axis. Then the pulse that brings me back, I choose its phase slightly different. I do a rotation around a different axis. Yeah. 
So uh, by choosing this phase to be proportional to uh, the square of the number of photons, they now think they're interacting. Yep. Great. So yes. So there is a little tiny, very tiny self curve, namely uh, Hubbard interaction, that's typically negative. That the high Q cavity, that's, but it's very small. It can be uh, kilohertz or something. I want something repulsive and much bigger. So I have to do this. So I could use a transmon as the object, and it's it has a strong negative self curve because it has a negative anharmonicity. I don't want yeah. If there's no dissipation, I could get away with a you know I could just change the sign of all the terms in the Hamiltonian. It wouldn't matter. But uh, the cavity uh, cavities have longer lifetimes than the transmon. That's the main reason I don't do it. Um, okay, so this this instruction set um, where you 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 um, you can like displace the cavity, then change all the phases of the uh, Fox states and and displace it again is extremely expressive in machine learning language, and with very short circuit depths, you can make all kinds of crazy states, uh, you know, superpositions of different Fox states, uh, etc. And uh, if you choose the phase to be this on the nth Fox state, you get exactly the time evolution of the, the Bose Hubbard term. So you have to trotterize. You do the a little hopping, then you do a little Bose Hubbard, then some hopping. And you, uh, if you trotterize all this, you can produce the Bose Hubbard model in uh, a magnetic field. So we get. Uh, all of that, and as I say, all of these things have been demonstrated experimentally on one and two cavities, but not on huge arrays. Yes. No, I, the, I don't need to control the frequency of the transmon. I just need to drive it to activate this four wave mixing term to do the beam splitter, if that's what you're asking. No, the transmon is only being virtually excited. It ends up always in the ground state. The frequency difference I need to hop a boson from one cavity to the other is supplied by the frequency difference of the pump. I send in a pump photon at one frequency, I take it out at a different frequency. Good question. Okay, uh, so um, there's a whole story about how you can do non-equilibrium bath dynamics. If see the one problem with this simulator, unlike electrons in two D two D electron gases, sometimes even in a high Q cavity, a photon disappears. That produces a defect in the Laughlin state. There is a way to fill it back in by careful bath engineering. Uh, and uh, um, then I may talk, I'll have to decide if I want to talk about that next time, or since I'm <laughs> falling behind, uh, skip over this. So I'll stop here and uh, you know we'll have a few minutes for questions then. Thank you. Yes, in a in a field. How do you cool it to the ground state? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um, how do you how you can I can make the real time dynamics, but how do I cool it to the ground state? That's the question. Well, it turns out then, in addition to programming unitary operations, you can program in um, bath dynamics and the and coupling to to cool things uh, to temperatures effective temperatures way below the refrigerator temperature it turns out 
And um, you can also, you know, turn on things adiabatically, the various tricks, but it turns out uh, that uh, math engineering, you, you, can, uh, you can invent something that doesn't eat up the photons, but kind of gives a little friction to a cold bath so they, they go down in energy. Yeah, but that's, that's an important task. Uh, if you just turn on the Hamiltonian suddenly, you're in some random, probably high energy state. Is it, what kind of noise? Yes. If you if you have a bath and you have first there's the temperature of the fridge, then there's you know non-equilibrium noise that could cause things to heat up. So you have to do some clever things. And typically the way you uh, make a bath colder than the refrigerator is you have some transition, you're trying to you know, make the rate of going up a lot smaller than the rate of going down, but this splitting is say smaller than the fridge temperature. But then you, you do like you do in dynamical nuclear polarization, you, uh, make, you map this onto some high energy transition, uh, much higher than the temperature. And uh, through that dynamics, you can cool objects to way below the fridge temperature. It's a kind of Carnot cycle where you know you have this guy and and some some you you map its states onto some high energy thing, and uh, which is cold even uh, because the splitting is big. Uh, so this is done in. Um, in uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, you drive an electron spin resonance, which is a thousand times higher in frequency, and it's coupled to the spins, and you cool the nuclei by coupling them to the electrons, which have a much bigger Zeeman splitting. So there are tricks like that. Can you also quantitate this, please? Um, uh, uh, Yes, so uh, if you want to do phase estimation to of the unitary, which is the dispersive coupling, that would count for you the number of photons. That parity measurement was a one-bit phase estimation. It was the least significant bit in counting the um, in in phase estimation for the photon number. Uh, yeah, I'll. Um, uh, in the, if I get to it, <laughs> I will show you a simulation of uh, the non-equilibrium dynamics of triatomic molecules, where we resolve 256 different photon states by what is effectively phase estimation. Yeah. Yes. 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 So, so um, the characteristic excitation gap in the quantum Hall effect has to do with the strength of the repulsion between the particles. In the ground state, they're staying away from each other. In excited states, they're at least somewhat on top of each other, and that that Hubbard interaction sets the scale. Uh, on a lattice, it's a little complicated. The, you, have, you have a band structure, which is not free particles and a completely flat Landau level. You have uh, Hofstadter bands, et cetera. Uh, but you still have this Hubbard U, which we can program. And, you know, we can, naive estimates suggest we should be able to make it big enough that we can um, do spectroscopy on the state and, and see these gaps. But uh, you know, in let's say with relatively near term future improvements in the hardware when we question, yes. So, like, here in the third hour, you can find a solution of something like the hydrogen. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. 
Yeah, so that was related to Matthew's question. If I turn on the Hamiltonian, I'm probably in some highly excited state. So I need to do some kind of, uh, I need to do bath engineering. I need to add some dissipation, which doesn't, uh, which couples to the density, but doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, eat up photons. It couples to N rather than A or A dagger in such a way that there's some dissipative mechanism that will cool it down to the ground state. And there are techniques for doing that, but I haven't talked about them. So I'm, I'm not removing photons. I'm, I'm saying when the photon hops, uh, maybe it gives up a little energy to another degree of freedom that I take away. There are ways to do that. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. So what do we, what do we have to do to go beyond two or three or four cavities? Well, first, uh, you have to get pretty big lattice sizes before you're not dominated by edge, you know finite size effects. So that that's a challenge. Then we need all these control lines for each uh, beam splitter, each transmon, each cavity. Pretty, so it's more of a control problem. And that's the same control problem we have to solve to build a quantum computer. So it's not, not unique to that. And um, uh, that, that's probably the main challenge. Uh, well, so photon loss is a problem. And uh, uh, one of the last reference in that list of references, Kurilovich et al., we've described how in principle you can engineer a bath that if you lose a photon, now you suddenly have M quasi holes sitting here at this place. You could very gently insert one photon with just the right energy to go in there. And not, and, and yet if there were, let's say, uh, uh, you wouldn't try to be adding photons on top of the perfect state because that would add Hubbard. There would be a gap. So if you're very gentle with the addition and slide the photon in under the gap, you can repair these losses. But the dynamics is extremely interesting because if you don't do it quickly enough, that pair of quasi holes will start wandering around and then they each have charge a half. There's a half a photon missing from each one. And when you, you want your refilling to, to not be able to refill that because it has to be gentle. There's no room to put a whole photon where there's a missing half. And so you have to wait for them to come back together. So the dynamics of that is very, very interesting. There's some long time scales associated with that. And there's lots of slides about that here, which. I may decide to give up on, but you're welcome to look at them and I'm happy to discuss. Okay, time for coffee. <laughs>